playing. Hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. We're both back. The Liquid Antiquarian is back uh, to mark the occasion of this extraordinary book published by James Eady, um, The Distilleries of Great Britain and Ireland. And it's great to have you. Uh... There we go. There's a book. There it is. It's great. It's heavy. So very briefly, if you've not watched the Liquid Antiquarium before, this is uh, a fun little project between myself and Dave where we get to share interesting little documents, objects, ephemera to do with uh, the booze industry generally. Uh, but this is a big document that we are looking at and uh, we thought it was worthwhile bringing in the heavyweights tonight. So who have we got coming along, Dave? Uh, tonight, Arthur, we have Professor Neil McKenzie, who's a Professor of Entrepreneurship and Business History at the Adam Smith Business School, University of Glasgow. And our dear friend, uh, Dr. Nick Morgan, uh, who also taught at Glasgow University in his previous life before he joined the dark side of, of whiskey, where he worked with Diageo for many, many years, and is now retired to become the author, an author and researcher, and written two rather marvellous books. Uh, both of which are available at all good booksellers uh, near you. Uh, so it's great to uh, have Nick and Neil with us. Slightly scary because, you know, we're playing with the big boys tonight, Arthur, you know. Uh, antiquarians, well, we just love all that stuff. Historians, well, they're professionals. Yeah. Did you get the whiskey I sent you? I did. Yes, it's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. What are we drinking? This is uh, from uh, James Eady, who um, and a cast selected by Leon, who is the chap who rooted around the British Library to find all the source material that went into this book from the Wine and Spirit Trade Record. Uh, we did a little episode about the making of that you can catch up with on YouTube. Dave, do you want to give a little, little introduction to the book, what it is and, uh, and how you see it initially? Yeah, th thanks, Arthur. Yeah, the, the book is a, a remarkable uh, collection of articles uh, wh which were written between 1922 and 1929. Essentially, if you think of Alfred Barnard, it's, it's similar to what Barnard did uh, back in the 1880s, uh, going around uh, the distilleries of Scotland and a couple of gin distilleries in, in England and also uh, distilleries in Ireland, finding out uh, how they operated. The beauty about this, uh, which has been painstakingly pulled together by, by Leon uh, and beautifully reproduced, I think that the glory of it is, is the images. Uh, you know, so you're actually being able to, to see what distilleries looked like at, the, at, at that particular time. And that gives, gives us as many clues, I think, as, as the text does. And I, I know that uh, I, I certainly want to talk about the text uh, later on, uh, about what's there, what's not there. Uh, and also why it might not be there as well, because you've got to really consider <coughs> who the readership were and what the, what these articles were about. So I, I've got some thoughts about that, and I know Neil and Nick uh, both have, have, have some ideas about that as well. But it's an extraordinary, extraordinary achievement <coughs> that, that Leon ha, uh, has, has done, uh, because this period of Scotch whisky is actually relatively little known, little written about. What distilleries were like, relatively little known uh, about as well. And it's a very important time in, in the history of Scotch whisky. So, you know, I think the first thing you've got to remember is, you know, the, the, these these articles are kind of advertorials, extracts from the trade paper. Uh, which is dealing with the entire industry, you know. So, so uh, there's news stories that exist with, within the paper as well as, as these these places as well, uh, these articles as well. So I think you've got to place uh, the profiles of these distilleries within that context, you know, within the fact that these are effectively advertorials. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, 
again, just kind of giving a wider context, which I know we're going to delve really deeply in, into later on, is that the 1920s are a period of crisis for, for the whiskey industry. Uh, you know, if you look at, at the book itself, I mean, 38 of these distilleries are mentioned in the book or written about in the book would be closed by the 1930s. And, and there you have, and this is from Moss and Hume, uh, the number of distilleries, I mean, that's roughly 140, just under 140 in 1920. It was 160 in 1899. And, you know, that goes down to uh, in 1933, in fact, there were only two operational distilleries in Scotland, i.e. there were only two working that particular year. So a catastrophic fall off uh, in terms of the number of distilleries, you know, uh, the equivalent of what happened in the 1980s uh, in, in, in Scotch. And that's kind of uh, what tends to be forgotten about when we look at whiskey history and the way that whiskey history has been written about, which is Scotch whiskey was on this kind of glorious upward uh, trajectory, you know, all the way from the 1823 onwards. And it's not true. You know, I, I, and I think that reading between the lines of, of this book, uh, this is an industry which is on its uppers uh, to, to, to some extent, that is facing a huge amount of, of, of crisis as well. Uh, you kind of pick that out when you kind of read between the lines. I mean, Towie Moore, uh, for example, uh, the entry for, for, for Towie Moore, uh, you know, there's a million gallons uh, of whiskey uh, which are, are, are there in, in Towie Moore. And it's, it's the fuse of account of what Towie Moore was like, but it's in administration. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, Glen Fine, uh, which was the the distillery in Ardrishic, uh, you know, again beautifully described, you know, lovely whiskey, peated to the same level as Isla, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the way that this is written is essentially a sales prospectus. You know, so, so a lot of the, these pieces are, I suspect, you know, the 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 owners of distilleries uh, kind of going help. To, to some extent, you know, please continue to have faith in the Scotch whisky industry. One of the things that, that kind of intrigued me in my, my kind of first read through, uh, especially looking at the Irish uh, distilleries, which are utterly, utterly fascinating chapters on, on the Irish uh, distilleries, is that there's no mention in the book of Irish independence. Uh, but there is uh, mention of Irish independence within the wider magazine. Uh, you know, so you've got to think of this as being there is a news section and there's a feature section and there's an advertorial section, you know, essentially the same as, well, I don't know, off-license news when I first started writing there. So so th there we have it. Here's my context, really. The industry of, uh, on the cusp of potential collapse, but the upside being we, we learn about new methods of working, about improvements and about innovations, about the, the arrival of scientific methods of making whiskey, of and significant changes in, in ownership and consolidation. So there's a huge amount uh, for, for us to get our, our teeth into over the next hour or so. Uh, hour or so. so uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, jumping in and, and getting the professional's view on this vast subject that, that <laughs> This book is suddenly suddenly brought to our attention. As am I. I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm actually going to shrink into the background a little bit because we've got so many amazing slides prepped up, many from the book, but also quite a few that we that are not from the book and some real great discoveries and contributions also. So I'm going to shrink into the background, do the kind of produce a bit and bring uh, Neil in. I would actually just say, Neil, as you come in, thank you so much for your support of the show. It was a real boost during those lockdown times when you got in touch and said you actually thought what we were doing was pretty good, as we <laughs> had always apologised for ourselves, even by calling it the liquid antiquarian and recognising that we weren't professionals. And you were always so kind. So thank you for supporting the show. And I'm going to shrink away. Uh, Arthur's shrunk away mid sentence. Uh, so, so uh, it, he's he's beavering away in the background there. Uh, and, uh, as ever, anybody who's got any comments, just uh, type them in. If we do have time, uh, we will get to the comments and uh, questions. But we may not have time. But but anyway, we, we will do our very very best. Neil, uh, absolutely great. I just just uh, second what Arthur said. Thank you so much for all your kind words and support. Uh, and I have to say, you know, I, you're a member of the Kelvin Dale Whiskey Society. So uh, a, a big shout out to, to all, all the folk, uh, whiskey drinkers in Kelvin Dale, where I was born. Uh, so, uh, 
So it's good to know that whiskey drinking continues in that fine borough of Glasgow. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, to join you guys this evening. Um, I, I've really enjoyed Liquid Antiquarian so far. Uh, I hope to maintain the standards this evening, but I can't promise you anything. Uh, you, you guys have done a fabulous job of, of um, telling interesting stories and, and bringing it to you know, bringing it to everyone's attention. And, and uh, you know, in some cases, actually reinvigorating interest uh, in, in brewing, distilling, and so on. So um, when you guys asked me about, you know, getting involved with this book, I was I was over the moon because um, I've enjoyed the show, I've enjoyed your your takes on on these things. But also, this book is is a fabulous achievement. You know, you're you're absolutely right in your description of it earlier, um, and so get an opportunity to go through it in in advance and, and discuss these things with uh, with you guys was was I was really excited by it. So thank you for inviting me on this evening. Not at all, not at all. And I, I know, you know, in, in our in the chats that we've been having prior prior to this, that uh, one of one of the areas that you picked out was was transport. Uh, you know, the the fact you know, <laughs> again, you can actually see uh, transportation. And I, I, I was thinking that, that that might be an interesting way to to kick things off. You know, as transport as a theme, because that for me kind of touches on the idea of the remoteness of, of a lot of these distilleries, you know, how reliant they were, and actually the modes of transport kind of indicate how remote uh, the, 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 you know, some, some distilleries were. They weren't just urban, some were next to railway lines, but some were still way, way out the country. Uh, so, you know, in, in terms of that, that kind of wider context, uh, how, how does transport fit in? Um, it's, you know, it's a good question. One of the things you're right. One of the, one of the, the first things that struck me going through the book, looking at the pictures and and reading and so on, was um, these are remote enterprises. You know, they, these are these are um, they're not the middle of nowhere in some cases. They're the end of nowhere. You know, these are very far away, uh, and in that respect, they're quite mystical and almost mythical, probably to the readership. You know, the readership's principally down south um, at this point. The Highlands is a wild and rugged place. The Islands, who knows what goes on and and you know, further up the field. So when I saw the ones with the railway sidings and so on attached, um, uh, what you're seeing is is obviously there's logistics, there's um, infrastructure, there's transportation concerns and so on. And what you see is is the deployment of lots of different types of transport. And that, like you said, Dave, is dependent on where they're located. So some of them have got the the rail, uh, railways up close, that allows them to get the grains and the coal and so on into the, the distilleries and it allows them to get the product out again. So you don't want your trains going uh, uh, back and forth empty. You want to be kind of utilising as best you can. So one of the things that struck me just looking at these pictures and um, you, you see it here, the barley delivery at um, Del Yuen, is there's a lot of work going in here. And, and so the transportation, I thought, was really interesting because... Um, in some cases, they've got uh, trains and railways. In other cases, they've got horse and cart. There's a picture of oxen, uh, which is a wee bit older, to be fair. It is about 30 years before. Um, and then you've got the canals and so on as well. So you're really seeing the, the kind of the transportation, logistics and infrastructure at play serving and uh, supporting the industry and even vice versa as well, because some of these uh, railways um, you know, are, are heavily used by the distilleries. But I love this picture of Glenugi. I've got to open actually just to the side of me here um, because you've got the you've got the horse and carts. Um, you've also got the, the whiskey in the barrels and then you've got the, the people involved in this. So, um, I mean, talking about so sort of looking at this picture, the man with the top hat presumably is probably quite important compared to the others because uh, he's suited and booted and, and has a very different style. Um, and he appears to be counting or holding something in his hand, which is probably some kind of um, record of what's going on. So what I really liked about the, the different images was was seeing how how they're operating at the time. Um, so, you know, you've got Springbank here with the, the horse and cart and, you know, Springbank's quite far away. Campbelltown is, is relatively remote at this point. It's not served by the railway. Um, so they're dealing with horse and cart almost exclusively, and then they're probably putting stuff onto the boat and then sending it over. So it's a totally different way of looking at the industry from what we see it now. And uh, in many respects, it's probably a lot closer to Barnard's um, experience in the 19th century when he was looking at it. Um, yeah, this one here with the, the canal along the side. Um, and then the horse and cart, and I think there's um, uh, the railway as well. 
it's a great example of seeing the three different sort of principal modes of transport. They also have motor cars as well and, and uh, vehicles in some of the, the images too. But I really liked seeing this because it made me think about just a lot of the effort that's going into the the um, industry at this point. That you know, it's we look at it now and it's a wildly different um, experience in some respects. But at this point, there's a tremendous amount of logistical um, challenges of 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 getting. Um, stock to and from the distilleries and, and getting the, the products out there. Um, plus, the, the old chains just look amazing. I think they look absolutely fabulous. And uh, my kids love Harry Potter, so they were excited to see some of those chains looking like Harry Potter chains. But um, I, I really do think it's, you know, it, it's um, these are images certainly of a bygone era. And I think that's really interesting from, from, a, um, from an industry perspective, but also from a a wider historical perspective. This is this is how people lived at this point. You know, it's, it's quite different from now. And I think as a as a record, the the book has a really good um, uh, a really good indication of of the differences of, of Barnard's time versus even at that point versus what we see now. Um, and just seeing this is a great. I thought this was a great juxtaposition of the the horse and cart on the right, and then the motor vehicle on the left. Um, and of course, the motor vehicle is probably traveling a wee bit longer distance than the horse and cart, but um, Again, just like transport just kept coming back to me as I was reading the book, and I kept thinking, you know, this was vitally important, um, really important to the industry because it's what's getting the product out of the, the distilleries and into the markets. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love these Glen Livet steam wagons as well, you know, because, you know, I think we touched on this in an early an antiquarian, you know, you, you can plot where distillery, the, the, the era that a distillery was built by its proximity to railways or road or whatever, and the earlier distilleries such as Glenlivet, which were, you know, all on old farms or miles away from anywhere. And, you know, that was one of the problems, you know, that, you know, that was one reason that Glenlivet was, was the only uh, distillery in the Glen for a long time, because there was no infrastructure. You know, they had to use steam wagons to get to the, the, the railhead. I mean, I... Yeah. It's important as well because this is this is still early transportation technology. You know, motorized uh, technology at that point is not it's not particularly old. You know, it's, it's these are power they're steam they're steam powered vehicles. You know, it's um you haven't even got to the motor car yet. You know, the kind of the way it's transportation. So so again, you're seeing the kind of the I mean, it's an industry that's about hundred years old by this point. Well, hundred years old from the 18, uh, 1820 Act, but it's. It's an industry. It's still in its infancy compared to what we see it now. So it's still it hasn't you know it's not a fully matured industry by any stretch at that point. And what was also interesting about the different um, portrayals of transportation is what it shows you is how diffuse the industry is at this point. You know these are these are dotted all over the landscape. There some are close to railways, some are not. Some are in farms, some are miles away. And so what the transportation does, as you just said, is it gives you an indication of of the diffuse nature of, of this industry. It's spread out. It hasn't, you know, it hasn't fully, um, hasn't kind of fully uh, matured in terms of its supply chains and logistics and so on. It's certainly kind of you know, spreading its wings a little bit, but it's not quite flying at this point. And, and, and how much, how much do you think the logistical challenges then played their part in the closure of so many distilleries? You know, what, would that have been an element, you know, when, when the great rationalization took place, you know, you know, the, the owners are kind of going, well, you know, it's just cost more to, to transport, you know, good here and there. So Yeah, I think I think that's definitely the case. I mean, if you look at where blending's taking place, it's taking place principally in the central belt. You know, it's in it's in Glasgow, it's in Edinburgh, it's in uh, Perth. Um, and these are quite far away. And if you consider like for us it takes an hour, an hour and a half to um, kind of get from the central belt into the highlands by train, right? So that's not maybe maybe two hours. For these guys, it, it, you're talking days in some cases, you know, prior to the railway, and even the railway at the time, still very, very slow and it's costly. So there's no question that they're they're facing this um these challenges around they're they're in a lo they're they're typically not always, but they're typically in a remote location. I mean in a remote location it costs you extra to get anywhere. Anyone, anyone who lives in um, certain PH postcodes will know when they try and order something online, they get a surcharge because the post office is it's too expensive for them even now. You know, and this is a hundred years ago, so it's a totally different situation, much more, um, uh, much more difficult, much more challenging to get the product from the distilleries into these markets. 
And your point about the advertorials, um, that kept coming back to me as well I, when I was reading this, because what they're essentially doing is their markets are essentially down south. You know, the markets are right, kind of the big markets are down south. Um, and so they have to get the products there somehow, whether it's via uh, the central belt blending locations and then onwards from there, or whether it's direct straight down uh, to, to the markets down south, it's still going to take time and it still costs a lot of money. So, um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I think transportation does play a big factor in, in the closure of these distilleries. Dave, can I just bring up a couple more slides with a special credit mention? Sure. We just came in today. Uh, so in the book, we had the Glendivitt steam wagons, but um, through a distant relative, um, Peter, who works at the... Grampian Transport Museum. Uh, well, this image he sent over, which I believe is a photograph in the Grampian Transport Museum, you do see that from time to time online. Yeah, the, the, the Glendivitt steam wagons, Sentinel steam wagons on the, on the move, really beautiful. But then also this one slightly earlier from Glen Dronach, <laughs> he hazarded a guess, probably 1910, something like that. This is the later one that probably would have been in use during the time of the book. Really beautiful, original photograph. And then as I think, um, Neil, you wanted to move on to talk a little bit about people. Can, can I just say there, Arthur, if you go back to the previous picture. Yeah. You've, you've estimated, um, no, no, I think the other one, uh, the one. Uh, uh, this one? Nope, one more. Uh, one uh, <laughs> No, no, it's, it's for the, the Glen, it's the Glendronic one. You've, yeah, this one here. So you've estimated in 1920, but it says established um, it's 1826. <laughs> yeah, I think it's 1826. But this is the thing you're looking if you look at this this vehicle, um, they've got the thick uh, kind of pneumatic tires. Um, it clearly isn't probably able to travel very long distances, and it's not exactly holding likely to hold a lot. You know, if you look at the the capacity mm. of that vehicle, and yet that is almost the height of technology in, in terms of transportation. You know, for um, for the kind of uh, the flexible uh, nature of it. So it, I, I think this is a, this is a great picture because I mean these guys look pretty happy as well. You know, they're, they're not having to they're not having to wrestle with horses or oxen or anything else. They've got they've got a machine that will largely do as it's told um, without too much concern. So uh, and and actually so. that's another thing. These pictures are fabulous because what they show is these guys are obviously manual laborers. You know, they're 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 quite they're quite dirty. You know, they, their their overalls are are filthy, um, and they clearly have, have had to work very very hard. Um, so so the the introduction of this mechanization of the transportation options that you have with uh, with the railways and with um, steam technology and, and uh, uh, motor vehicles and so on does make a big difference, I think, to their their own lives. You know, and I think that's really important to recognise here that we just we often get sucked into viewing it. This is how you get the whiskey from the distillery to the market. What about the effect it has on the people working there? And mm. you know, not having to clean up after the horses is probably quite a nice you know, nice change for them. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, we do credit uh, wherever we can and, and put the source wherever we, we find things. But these images were just so beautiful. I want to say a special thank you to Peter from the Grampian Transport Museum. And although admittedly it's a little bit later, this is his estimate, 1930s, he also came up with this image of Balvenie. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> that is a beauty. Yeah. That is a cracker. Uh, I yeah. don't think Fairgreave's got that in, in the archive. If you're yeah. watching, Andy Fairgreave. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Peter. I'll go away. Uh, yeah, th th just kind of before we bring, bring Nick in, maybe just quickly touch on kind of th this idea of the social, social history. If, you know, that was again something that you picked up. And it was something that I, I noted, you know, Arbeg, for example, you know. There are 150 people living in the village of Arbeg. You know, there was a school there. There was Bowling Green. There was, you know, all manner of uh, things. You know, it was it was, it was a community. Uh, Caledonian uh, in, in in Edinburgh. 150 people in, in in the workforce. You know, so you're seeing distilleries really becoming community hubs as well. And again, kind of projecting this in, in terms of the context of the time and what what, what was going through. So. You know, you're in the 1920s going into 1930s. You know, the, the, this, this crash that took place in the Scotch whiskey industry at the time, all whiskey, but the Scotch whiskey industry as well, 
huge effect on, on, on communities as well. Yeah, and that's one of the other things is that when we talk about the diffuse nature and the peripherality of these distilleries, you're absolutely right to point out that they're they're community hubs. You know, they're they're keeping they're keeping communities alive, and they're they're these kind of what we'd call anchor points, um, industrial anchor points, which in peripheral remote locations are critically important to the the vitality of the of the uh, locale. And um, the people in these pictures, if you Arthur, if you maybe click back one. Um, I was really taken with these pictures. The one in the middle um, at the bottom is the guy, I think he's worked in this distillery for 75 years or so. Um, top left, you've got your workers there and uh, you know they're obviously, they've got their malt shovels um, and they're they're standing quite proud. You know, they're obviously, they're proud to be part of these um, distilleries, part of these communities. And then on the right-hand side, um, we were talking before the show, and uh, Nick pointed out the man in the middle who looks a bit like Tommy Shelby from the Peaky Blinders is almost certainly the customs and excise man uh, in the middle. And he sticks out like a sore thumb because he is very well put together, quite officious, and uh, he, he looks like he's in control. You know, He looks like he knows exactly what he's doing there. Um, yeah. And so the, these social images are just great. Uh, the, other, the other thing here is I think this is the only picture in the book with some dogs in it. Is that right? I think that's. Uh, I think that might be the case. Um, and what you're seeing here is the hierarchy is quite apparent. You know, and you can tell on the one hand by the cleanliness of the workers, on the other hand by the the, the, the attire they're wearing. You know, so the one's got the okay, a trilby uh, type hat. One's not even wearing a hat, which is incredible. Because I think in every other picture, someone's got a hat on. Uh, there's maybe one or two that don't. So, um, and these big flat caps are are kind of. Uh, probably workers a little bit further down the food chain. So um, the book's a really fabulous representation of all sorts of different you know, um, characteristics and, and social norms and cultural values and so on. Um, you've got your white jacketed ones here uh, working in the bottling lines. Um, this is in Ireland, I think, is it? Is that John Power? Yeah, uh, that's John's in Dublin. So, so you're seeing... You're seeing all sorts of different examples of um, the stratification of class, uh, social um, standing, and so on within uh, within British society at this point. So, it, I mean, as as a as a working kind of document, it's a really brilliant piece of work because it really does show how the how the industry is is behaving, how it's operating in different ways. Um, you know, you've got you've got females on the workforce there. Um, you don't see any of them in the distilleries. <laughs> so they're yeah. they're not yeah. present in distilleries, they're they're very much present elsewhere. Um you've got this brilliant picture of them standing on the on the on the steps of the office staff at Fettercairn. I mean, I I love these pictures. I've spent honestly the last few weeks looking at the pictures as much as anything else because it's it's a really wonderful way of capturing the industry um at a time when as you said we didn't know a great deal about it. Um, or, or not, not we didn't know a great deal about it, but we're missing information. And this does a really good job of filling a lot of those gaps. That's brilliant. Thank, thank you so much for that, for that, Neil. I, I, I want to bring uh, Nick in uh, at, at this point because there, there's another area. Hello, Nick. You can wake up now. Uh, there's. I've, I've been, I've been listening. I was just going to actually say yeah, yeah, yeah. a couple of points in terms of the people and the transport. The majority of the men in those photographs will have been away at war for four years or more. And they will have had such an experience of technology and, and horses as well, of course. So I think it's a very different workforce that comes back into these distilleries in 1919 and 1920 in terms of their expectations and their ability to handle uh, equipment. You know, and, and Neil, as we've discussed, there's a lot of equipment in some of these distilleries, you know, there really is. No, it's a very, it's a very interesting point. There's a lot of engineering suddenly, you know, that, 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 that's that, that's uh, getting, that's arriving in distilleries as well. And actually, in passing, uh, but, oh. but before, but before yeah, there's your Morton's refrigerator there, then, Nick. Uh, I yeah, really I'm, only wanted that for Andrew Symington, if if he's watching, which I doubt. But you know, that's an Andrew Symington photograph. And Andrew, if you are watching, there are dozens of them in this book. It's astonishing. <laughs> The, the, you know, the just speaking about, about women there, uh, just in passing, uh, in the Glenfiddich entry, you know, the, there's there's talk about the women working on the bottling line, and a lot of these women, or perhaps their daughters or relatives, during the Second World War, uh, worked in the cooperage and at, at Glenfiddich, you know. So, so that there's this very interesting. Again, the social history is very very important. But maybe coming back to that that technology thing, Nick. Uh, 
what we're we're seeing here is, as I said earlier, the industry on the cusp. You know, you have descriptions of old style distilleries. You know, old Pulteney, Talisker described as being kind of old style distilleries. But you have the introduction of science. You know, you know, Hazelburn be, be, being being a, a classic example. Distillery okay. laboratories. So, so we, uh, let, let's hold Hazelburn. We're going to come back to that, um, Arthur. So the first thing I think I would say is that. Throughout this book, there's a real tension, and Neil, again, Neil and I discussed this when we spoke last week, between the old and the new, and between tradition and innovation. And it's a tension that still exists in the industry today. You know, it's very much there in the marketing language that, that brands use in Scotch whiskey. They all want to respect the old, and yet they're all doing the very new. And here's, here's a quote from, from, from Banff, where the traditional methods of making malt whiskey have been handed down from father to son and carefully observed, but no pains have been spared to provide the works with all the latest modern improvements. And that's what's going on. You've got tradition and you've got modern improvements and many of the modern improvements. And again, if, if, if someone did a textual analysis of this, the number of times labor saving devices as a phrase uh, crops up throughout this. So. For example, that picture of um, Glenmorangie with all those people, I can tell you 30 years or 20 years later, there'd be half that number, if, if that, you know. So there's something going on in terms of labor and work going on there. Um, and, and the other thing that's interesting, I think, uh, and it's sort of the, the reality uh, measured against what, what a trade journal uh, wants to talk about, is this relentless optimism in all, all of these uh, en entries, which, which frankly goes totally uh, in the face of what's really happening. When distilling started in uh, 1919, 1920, there, there, there was this great spurt to make whiskey, which meant that actually for all of the 1920s, there were loads of whiskey from 1920, 21 that no one could sell. But what's actually going on, certainly from the middle of this, in fact, not the middle, about a third of the way through this series, is that distilleries are closing everywhere. And if you looked at newspapers, and I know we've got a slide, um, Arthur, of this one, if you were to browse through newspapers, you'd get a very different story from the headlines there uh, than, than, than you get from reading, like I say, these relentlessly optimistic portraits of, of distilleries. And it's important, I think, when people read a book like this, just to understand the context mm -hmm. and just to ask a few questions about what it is that's in there. And I'm by, by no means um, denigrating what's there, because like everyone else, I just think this book is remarkable, you know, and I have read 588 pages of it very closely. Um, but, but, you know, you, you need to think what it is. It's a trade journal. What do trade journals do? Well, they they publish puff and flannel on behalf of the people that advertise there, just like whiskey magazines do today. They're the mouthpiece of their advertisers. And that's principally what's going on uh, in the wine and spirit trade record. And at the same time that they're doing uh, distilleries of the United Kingdom, they're doing famous champagne houses of, of France in the same degree of detail with the same wonderful photographs and they're doing famous sherry firms. And again, all the same six pages, each one, all this sort of stuff. And it's all about what a trade magazine should do for its clients. So of course, they're going to be relentlessly optimistic and they're going to tell you a great story. Yeah, um, I, I, I think that's particularly poignant. I, I, I think uh, when you read the Campbelltown entries. Well, exactly, so Loch Ruin. The, 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 renaissance, the renaissance of the Campbelltown whiskey trade, it says, the renaissance of the Campbelltown whiskey trade, scientific methods of production with the advent of new machinery are rapidly putting new vitality into some of the distilleries in Campbelltown. It closed two years later, right? <laughs> it closed two years later. And then the classic one is Hazelburn. <laughs> Real classic one is Hazelburn. And I want to talk about Hazelburn uh, for two different reasons. First of all, because actually reading stuff that's not in the wine and spirit trade record, and, and I think it's another thing that people need to understand, there's loads of information around if you go and look for it, okay? There's loads of stuff there. Um, 
so Hazelburn, uh, the entry there, which, which in a sense I believe is one of the most important entries in the whole book, and I'll explain why in a moment. But Peter Mackey had purchased of Whitehorse Distillers, the famous Peter Mackey, supposedly a great eccentric, but in my view, a great innovator, very forward thinking man, had bought um, Hazelburn in uh, um, 1919. And it's been argued, David Sturck in his book on Campbelltown Distillery said, well, he only bought it because he wanted the warehouses. And it's true that he did actually fill the warehouses full of whiskey from Speyside in a famous train journey. There's another transport story about how all this whiskey came down from Speyside and found its way eventually to Campbelltown. But he also did try and make whiskey at Hazelburn. But the thing was that Peter Mackey, here's a blender, here's a man in the trade. He knows what's going on. So when he tried to make whiskey at Hazelburn, he did not try to make Campbelltown whiskey. In, in fact, he distinctly eschewed making Campbelltown whiskey because, because of, and then Arthur, can we have the first slide on that? Because I know you've got them. So these are circulars which are in the um, Di Di Diageo archive. And this is, this is Peter Mackey announcing to the trade in the UK that he's changed the style of whiskey at uh, at Hazelburn. And in fact, in one of them, he goes on to say he's brought in a distiller from um, Speyside who may well be Alan Wollstoneholm's mm -hmm. uh, forebear. I think Alan's on, on, on this. I saw his name there earlier. Um, and he's brought in a maltman and he's done this and he's done that. And the whole idea is to get rid of what he calls the, the characteristically unpleasant goo of Campbelltown whiskey. So in other words, it doesn't taste very nice. So he's trying to get rid of this objectionable goo and turn it into a whiskey like the North Country or the Speyside whiskies that would be acceptable to blenders because that's the market that these people are selling to. You're not selling to individuals. You're not selling to consumers. You're selling to large blending houses. You're selling to brewers like James Eady, in fact, who, who blended their own whiskey. And you're also selling to wine and spirit merchants who might be doing it on a small scale. So in the end, he says... This is no longer Campbelltown whiskey. I'm not going to even call it Campbelltown. I'm not going to besmirch it with the name of Campbelltown. We're going to call it Hazelburn Kintyre mm. to try and take away all the stigma that actually existed about Campbelltown whiskey, which strangely enough is not spoken about in any of the profiles in the record, right? It doesn't quite manage to get in there. Um, and he talks then about the lab and how he's used science to do that. I'm going to talk about the lab in just a moment. But the thing about this experiment, actually, it's a bit like uh, King Canute trying to keep the waves away. It was an absolute failure. Yeah. It was an absolute failure. Hazelburn closed in, closed in 1925. And after Peter, Peter Mackey died, the, um, the directors of Whitehorse Distillers in the end just decided to ditch the whiskey because no one wanted to buy it. And, yeah. and, that, that, was, and that was the problem. Yeah. With Campbelltown, and that's not what you read in these things. So people, and I know there are lots of Campbelltown enthusi whiskey enthusiasts around at the moment. You need to understand that when you're reading this stuff, the size of the mash tun might be right, you know, <laughs> and all of that, all of that detail that's in in these wonderful descriptions. But the real world is slightly different from the real real world. Yes, yeah. right. Okay. It's a really interesting point that and I remember speaking with Frank McCarthy years ago in the trip to Springbank and asking him what why he thought Springbank survived. And he said his his take on it was that Springbank didn't produce traditional Gambleton whiskey, you know. Uh so you know, the, one reason that they continued to to trade was they probably didn't produce the, the objectionable goo. goo. Yeah, whiskey in the style, whiskey in the style. But let, let's let's go back to Hazelburn and the lab. And Arthur, we have a wonderful photograph, which, which I think, in a sense, so so what, what we've got in this book is this snapshot. Like It's like Barnard. It's just this snapshot of a moment from which you can try and deduce what was going on. You can try and deduce what might have been going on in the past. And you can try and deduce what was going to happen in the future. But this photograph, actually, is all about the future of malt whiskey distilling. So this is the lab at Hazelburn that Peter Mackey opened in 1920. And he employed a man to go there called Stuart Hasty, who's mentioned in the book. And in the book, they talk a little bit about what they did in the lab. 
And Hastie had trained in fermentation science at Younger's before the uh, First World War. He'd been in the war and served in the tank regiment and, and was highly decorated um, and, and also must have been a bit crazy to get into a tank, basically, uh, in, in, in the first tank engagement on the Somme. But he came back to Hazelburn, set up this lab, and this was about, if you will, distilling as we understand it today. OK, this, this, what happened at, at the White Horse Distilleries um, was about distilling today. Uh, and I'll read you. Why not? Why not? You're here. From, from a letter written by Peter Mackey in 1923, talking about what Mr. Hasty does. Um, oh, and by the way, just uh, talk, talking about something else that cropped up, um, Mackey describes the lab that he has and says he has a girl assistant, just a very clever girl. So women in distilling, I think it might well go down to the girl assistant in the lab at Campbelltown about whom I'm trying to find out more. Hastie's work is to check all the malt. He can tell from the barley what the possible extract should be. And if we don't get that, he wants to know the reason why from the manager. And he generally finds out. It may be improper drying in the kiln or the yeast or some other course. For a considerable time at Lagavulin, we were getting 98% of the possible extract, which is very good. It keeps our various brewers and managers up to scratch. And if there is any bad work or ethers in the spirits, Hasty pays a visit to assist them to get rid of it. Indeed, with regard to pollution and the general working of the distilleries, he is practically, practically an inspector and is expected to go around twice a year to visit the various distilleries. He has been with us now for two or three years and we would not be without him. Otherwise, otherwise, we would be working by the old rule of thumb, which is no good. Hmm. So in 1923, this is the important bit. 1923, Hasty goes to Glasgow. They move the lab, possibly the very clever girl as well, to Glasgow. 1927, 1927, uh, when Whitehorse distillers uh, are acquired by the distillers company, Hasty and his lab are moved to Coates Crescent. And I believe that's the lab that Maureen Robinson was working in when I first met her in 1990. So there's sort of takes, takes me back a bit to this one. But more importantly, by 1930, Hasty was managing director of Scottish Malt Distillers and was responsible for the management and the operation of over 50 single malt distilleries and what I've just described to you is how they were managed mm. and what I've just described to you Dave as you will know very well is how almost all distilleries are managed today that's mm. modern distilling and that's captured in that photograph uh, of Hazelburn which I was so excited when Leon showed me this it was like holy <laughs> shit this, this is, is so important what is photograph, you know awesome. Yeah. And, and uh, Arthur, uh, I think you found a, a few other labs or mentioned of labs uh, elsewhere. Yeah, Strathclyde. Uh, yeah, and there's another one. And they, but these are mostly um, these are mostly yeast related labs. Right. Right. And, and, and the point about Hastie's lab is that um, this is this is about changing the way that distilling is done. It's about mm. changing the whole structure of the industry with the responsibilities of managers and it's moving to that point, I think, where, where the people who are responsible for what happens in the distilleries are no longer the people on the ground. They're increasingly the, pe the, the people in the back room. And, and uh, as we would say today, very often the blenders, the blenders are calling the shots yeah. and they will determine what's happening. And the blending companies are so interesting as well, because, of course, if you read through, I've just got another note if I can find it. Um, Cardew, mm. Cardow, Cardow, I should say, Cardow. The best equipped and most progressive, most progressive distillery in the country. The management ever on the lookout for new ideas. John Walker and Sons Limited, who described themselves in every sense as a progressive company. That was what that business was all about. That's what that little fellow walking around is about that.
progression, that sense of movement and dynamic improvement. And if you read these pages, and you know, you said at the beginning, Dave, you have to read through the lines. Mm -hmm. You know, you can look at the pictures, and the pictures tell us a lot, although not all the pictures are quite as they seem, but the pictures tell us quite quite a lot. But you you have to read through the lines. And if you read through the lines, what you see in this book is the hand of the large blending companies who themselves are being restructured into, into mm -hmm. the CCL combine. That's all going on in the background as well. And Scottish malt distillers with Stuart Hasty and all of that stuff. That's what's really driving the change and improvement here. You know, it's the blending companies calling the shots. And I think, although there isn't a great deal here, as in Barnard, you have to really struggle to try and find something that's telling you what the whiskey might taste like. Yeah. I mean, it is it is there, you know, 30 hour fermentations. That's, yep. quite, interest, that's quite an interesting one, um, you know, and stuff like that. But it's far and few between. But it's these blending companies that are driving what's going on. And, and I find that um, very yeah. Yeah, I think that's really fascinating. Again, they're just kind of picking up that slightly about Hasty and Hasty's visits, you know, around the estate, you know, the White Horse estate, and then looking at the Lagavulin uh, entry, where you see Lagavulin moving towards this more scientific, modern way of, of, of making whiskey, and Malt Mill being deliberately kept yeah. uh, as being the old style. And this is how, yeah. you know, this is how yeah. it was made. Horse hair, uh, you know, uh, on the, on the kilns and peat braziers and everything, yeah. you know, and saying we are keeping that almost as a model. Uh, yeah, what well, the improvements take, take place in Lagavulin. I, I find that utterly, utterly fascinating. And, and I think that's uh, for all the other stuff that's written about malt mill. I think that's the sort of um, you know exemplifies the the romanticism of Peter Mackey actually, because on the one uh, on the one hand he was he was a driver of progress and innovation. And yet, on the other hand, he really respected the old ways of doing things. So what better than to have a an old-style distillery and then crank it up everywhere else? Neil, I would like to kind of bring you back in this. And, you know, we can now, you know, I'll, I'll just kind of chat together. But but just looking at that, picking up on, on Nick's point about this being, you know, a changing point, you know, the 1920s being the shift uh, in production, uh, you know the greater use of electricity. You know steam. Uh, the 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 greens economizer. I I think I'm obsessed with greens economizer. And thank you, Mr. Cheeser. Who, who, lovely to hear from Mr. Cheeser. Apparently, you can still buy greens economizer. Uh, but all all the, all this new equipment, uh, labor saving devices, reed beds, uh, automation. Uh, you know the things that we think are novel now. You know in terms of sustainability. Uh, they're, they're being trialled in, in in the 1920s, you know. Uh, so be, what, what's your take on, on, on that, Neil? About this? Um, so, so Nick and I were discussing this last week, and what you're seeing here is a, a period of innovation where they're adopting these new technologies across a range of different um, a range of different distilleries, and you're seeing uh, efficiency drives and so on. But going back to Nick's point, really, what they're 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 clear about is. Um, is the importance of quality. It's maintaining the quality or, or upping the quality of the spirit. And that's driven, as Nick said, by the blenders who are demanding consistency. You know, and if you think about the, the relatively rudimentary nature of the technologies deployed here, they're Victorian technologies. Trying to get consistency must have been an absolute nightmare. So, so you've got the skill of the of the distillers, right? And and that's no, you know, not to be um, downplayed at all. But then also you've got the skill of the blenders who are obviously dealing with probably wildly inconsistent uh, whiskey types um, on a fairly regular basis coming coming to them. And that may be dependent on crop yield, might be dependent on whether they've got the right strain of yeast, um, could be whether there was a, you know, a dry harvest, any number of different things there. So the innovation and the technology they're deploying are, are all attempts at kind of mitigating some of the uh, challenges they face around distillation around quality around um, uh, consistency and then on the flip side of that you've got I was saying this to, to Nick last week and to Ian Russell you've got these distilleries using electricity and in the highlands and islands it, actually there's no electricity until the late 1940s so so the highlands and islands isn't electrified until the late 1940s so there's every possibility you've got people working in these distilleries 
with modern technology like you know electricity, which is still modern at this point, and they're going home to you know oil burning lamps and and coal fires and everything else. So so these guys are are seeing with their own eyes like the march of technology, and it's really interesting I think to look at that and think about the lives of these workers, the lives of the people in the distilleries who some of them will be in the the distillery cottages, and some of them might have electricity for a couple of hours if they're lucky, but then it's back to oil burning lamps and everything else. And that to me was really interesting because the, the electrification of the Highlands comes 20, 25 years later, Highlands and Islands, um, and that's only as a result of government uh, policy. So the, the, um, the integration and uh, imposition of the hydro schemes, you know, to, to kind of generate electricity for them and sort of consistent electricity generation. Whereas what you see with these distillers or these distilleries is they've got dynamos, they've got all sorts of kind of novel attempts at, at creating their own electricity and whatnot. And those won't have been inconsistent either, right? So those won't have been, you know, um, fail safes or, or kind of uh, a proven technology that works on a consistent basis. There's every possibility they were up and down and not quite working well and needed a bit of you know uh, jiggery pokery to get them working and so on. So it's a really interesting you know just these photographs and the descriptions of the technologies being deployed. You've got um, is it Glenugi has got the water wheel and the wind mill as well. Now yeah. if you think about this, you've got you know water wheels and windmills are very old technology, very, very old. And then you've got right at the cutting edge these these you know, um, electric uh, technologies in play as well. So I, I was looking at this and thinking, what must it have been like for the workers, You know, for these guys going in and out? Because um, the other thing is that they're probably not highly trained electricians. You know, they're probably not kind of, they might just go, a kick and I'll get it going again or you know maybe don't touch that with your fingers because you know I saw I saw it happen to a guy last week and it was terrible so you know but this is really novel technology for them at this time and it's and again they're they're operating typically in fairly peripheral locales as well so if something goes wrong they're probably quite far away from a hospital or, or from a doctor you know it's it, there's all sorts of I mean as Nick was saying reading between the lines or to coin a phrase reading against the grain You'll see there all sorts of <laughs> there's all sorts of of subtext here about peripherality and so on, and then the implication is what does that mean for the people there? And of course, if you're quite far away, like if you're at um, uh, Springbank and you've got your electric lights and so on, if something goes wrong with that, do you have a backup? You know, you're going back to the old ways again, and so that'll have an impact on how the, the whiskey is made and so on. So, you know, I thought it was really interesting, really, really interesting looking at that. Uh, that dimension of technology. I, I Neil, d d d before we kind of the, the explore the, the the wider context in terms of the industry, I mean, uh, how does this fit into the Scottish economy uh, at this particular point? Um, so the, Scottish, the Scottish economy at this point is dominated by the staple industries, um, which are coal, steel, and shipbuilding, um, steel and iron, and shipbuilding. Um, I was looking at uh, employment figures for the interwar period. And you're seeing um, uh, coal and steel. I mean, coal, I think, is employing around about 160,000 or thereabouts, um, 156,000. Iron steel manufacturers, 41,000. Uh, engineering and iron founding is 86,000. Um, uh, shipbuild, so no, shipbuilding is 86,000. Uh, engineering, general engineering is 111,000. Textiles are 146,000, uh, and and whiskey isn't even mentioned. You know, as a, as a terms of the size of pop, uh, size of employment, it's not even at the races. So Scotland at this point is dominated by these big, big heavy industries, these extractive industries, um, the engineering industries, and then your textile as well. So, so at this point, the industry is still very much a small player. You know, but it's. It's an important local employer in terms of the diffuse communities that it sustains and and, um, and supports. But in terms of the overall Scottish economy, it's a very, very, very small figure. Um, and that's interesting because, of course, now we, we laud the success of whiskey and how it's changed. And it's one of Scotland's biggest exports and, and so on. But at this point, you're really looking at these big, heavy staple industries um, for, for their employment. What's also happening at this point as well is that these big staple industries 
are in serious decline. Like at this point, there's already concerns about the industrial structure in Scotland. There's concerns of productivity gains or lack thereof. Uh, they're seeing a reduction in employment figures. So the numbers I just gave you there, there's already a decline in each of those industries, um, a fairly marked decline within... Uh, so the figures I gave you are from 1924. By 1930, they're already reducing in number. So you're looking at a period here where, you know, these... The workers that Nick mentioned earlier come back from the war. They've been promised homes for heroes. They've been promised all sorts of good stuff. And it's not happening. It's not happening in Scotland especially. So if you look at interwar UK, there's a lot of kind of literature and, and writing about it, talking about the relative stability. Things are okay. It's not too bad. Um, you know, the kind of roaring 20s and so on. That's not the case in Scotland. You've got political unrest in Red, uh, Red Clydeside. You've got an interwar housing boom. So I'm, I'm in a house just now that was built in 1925. So I'm right slap bang in the middle of that. But it's really not the case across the board that actually the Scottish economy is in serious trouble. And mm -hmm. there's recognition that they have to start doing things about that. So they introduced the Special Areas Act, which covers the entirety of Scotland uh, under government jurisdiction for supporting industries development with the exception of Edinburgh. So Edinburgh's the only part because it's too wealthy and it's too well off. Everywhere else gets support. Edinburgh, you don't need the money, you're fine. So, you know, I'm in Glasgow. We call Edinburgh the Far East you know, because it's another it's another world. I was there today and it was great, but, you know, glad to be home. Um, but if you look at Scotland at this point, you are seeing, you know, significant um, challenges in the Scottish economy, Scottish industrial structure, and that has a knock-on effect across um, policy decisions, across people's lives. There's depopulation of the highlands and islands. Everyone's heading down to the central belt for jobs because there's there's not much to sustain them up north. And so it really is, you know, going back to Nick's point about this um, relentless enthusiasm and, and positivity, is so, that, uh, yeah, it's an advertorial because it because that is not reflective of what's going on across the Scottish economy at all. Yeah. So yeah, and and you know, kind of picking up on that and coming to you then, Nick. I mean, just looking at I'm looking at some some of the you know the 38 distilleries that, that were closed. I, I became somewhat obsessed with Bankier Distillery. Mm. Uh, I, I think I, I perhaps I believe the advertorial too much, but you know here is a substantial distillery. You know, and, and you read the equipment and everything seems to be extremely well set up. But that didn't survive. Uh, Royal Irish, uh, you know, as I said, you know, the, the, we could do an entire program just on the Irish distilleries. I think it's well worth talking about Royal Irish because here was a profitable distillery. Dunville's well, it was one of the, the biggest Irish brands in the world. It closed in the 1930s because the directors, even though it was profitable, because the directors were spooked about what the future of whiskey might be, you know, and, and that was the last of the big Northern Irish distilleries to, uh, to, to, to exist, you know. So, you know, you, you, you were left with, 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 with Bushmills and Com or uh, Colerain for, 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 a, for a while. But, you know, it's, so we, we seem to be at this point where there is a shift taking place and a couple of things are happening. You know, your big, apparently substantial and safe distilleries are, are closing down. You're seeing some distilleries shifting uh, their emphasis, uh, Cars Bridge, you know, for example, moving into, you know, Glen Oakle, moving into yeast production and, and laboratories. Uh, the controversy that there was over Strathclyde even opening. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, which DCL, you know, were, were, were worried about, really concerned about it. And, and actually, incidentally, you know, Strathclyde being the last entry in the book and the only entry in the book, as far as I could see, with an overt mention of the, the the problems which the industry was facing, anyway, you know, Nick. I mean, maybe you could just give a the, the wider context of what is happening in the industry. Why is this happening? Yeah, uh, just just on Strathclyde, I saw a great quote when I was in the British Library looking at some stuff to prepare for this on Saturday, and it uh, it described the uh, the the um, the issue for for shares for Strathclyde Distillery as being a source of wonder amongst the industry. You know, no one could believe that anyone was crazy enough to, to do what they did there. So, I mean, the background, the background to this, I talked about the big hand of the blenders, um, you know, being very evident, I think, in what's happening in the distilleries. 
But I think even more so what's happening here, of course, is the big hand of uh, WH Ross and the distillers company. And you've got this process of consolidation, um, which, which in a sense, uh, in my view, I mean, some people might disagree, but in my view, this uh, all actually sort of dates back to the Pattersons in Leith, um, whose, whose failure has reverberations that go way beyond the, 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 the First World War. And then, of course, the First World War adds another layer of complexity to this. It means for many of the old established blending companies who don't necessarily have a successor or a succession plan in terms of management, and they're sitting on lots of old whiskey. And what people want in 1919, 1920, 1922, particularly people in the United States, is old whiskey. They don't want 1921 distillates from Campbelltown or anywhere else for that matter. So suddenly these people have got a huge asset and an opportunity to get to exit from the business very, very profitably. Um, at the same time, W.H. Ross at the distillers company sees himself, as far as anyone can tell, as the architect of the industry. He's the man who's in control of all the pieces on the chessboard. And he gradually um, brings in Buchanan Dewar and then Johnny Walker, and they've been talking about this from the 1890s. So these are discussions that have been going on for almost 20 plus years. Um, and they're brought in to the DCL. Uh, Sir James Calder, who was, who was Banky was one of his distilleries. Calders are brought in, and they um, and they're part of the game. And then, as I said, White Horse Distillers. And I think the way that it worked, uh, maybe not so much with um, certainly with Walkers, who I think were very emotionally attached to their estate, and and they were a bit in the way the merger worked, they were a bit distant in terms of the ownership of places like Cardew and Mortlach and stuff like that. But I think the deal was that once you went into the DCL, anything was up for grabs in terms of taking it out of production. And what Ross was concerned about was was um, was was really stopping overproduction. So it was getting some sort of balance into the industry, um, and 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 of course, um, and uh, I'm sure the the agile lawyers wouldn't like this. It was also about establishing a dominant position for the DCL as a grain whiskey producer, but also for those companies within the DCL who were blending houses as well. And so that's very much, I think, the background to almost everything that happens. And, and of course, uh, Ross decimated the Irish whiskey distilling industry. You know, uh, or some people might say almost vindictively decimated the Irish whiskey distilling industry. <laughs> And, and that was partly partly because so much Irish whiskey was coming to Scotland and being used in Scottish blends, cheap Scottish blends. Uh, and so one of the one of the ways to stop that was just to close the places down. Yeah, I mean, he, he did write at one point, well, Irish whiskey is now in the relevance, you know, to, mm -hmm. and there's a certain degree of glee. And it, uh, I, I was thinking in that particular. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Did, so, so the, there's, there's a, in Campbellton's case, it, it, your argument is that it's low quality. Uh, then there's consolidation, the, which means that Buchanan's or or or, or whoever Buchanan Dewar, etc., kind of go right here. That is surplus to requirement. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there seems to be a number of different dynamics at, at, at work here. In yeah. terms oh, of and then and then location as well. You know, so yeah. you know, then, then, then then Dave, the, there's the Great Depression. You know, just just, just when <laughs> everyone thought they might have got away with it, you know, it's just absolute catastrophe. Yeah, and and I think people need to understand. And I did. For anyone that's interested, I do, do talk about this a little bit in the Johnny Walker book about what happened to that business in the interwar years. And I mean, it's just from one, thank you, Dave. It's, uh, it's one disaster to the next. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. But one, one thing that's interesting from that, and despite these innovations that we've talked about and, and changes, which I think mostly were happening in the, in the early 20s, is that my my sort of hypothesis uh, is that most of these distilleries, as described in this book, did not really change until the late 1950s and the, and the early 1960s, when suddenly there's a new wave of investment, 
the British government is pressing distillers to make whiskey so it can be sold to the United States and elsewhere to get foreign currency to help post-war reconstruction. So, so this snapshot is a snapshot not just of 1922 or 1923. I think for those distilleries that survive, despite closures during the war and all the rest of it, but to, to survive through to the 50s, this is how whiskey was being made then. When, when Cardoux redeveloped in the early 1960s, there's an inventory of all the plant that was there. Remember, this is Cardi that's described as the most modern and innovative distillery in 1923. All the plant was Victorian. It had all gone in in, in, in the 1890s, you know. Yeah. Well, so, uh, for whiskey geeks, you know, for whiskey geeks who are sort of desperate to try and taste and understand what whiskey from, from what they call the olden days uh, was like, well, th this book is about the olden days whiskey. Because yeah. everything changes in about 1957, William, when you have the introduction of uh, concurrent mashing, fermenting, and distilling, which immediately changes the way all of these distilleries work. And then you have all the distillery rebuilds and expansions and all the rest of it, and Kalida being rebuilt and so on and so forth, all of that stuff. Everything changes then. But what you've got in this book is a real sort of vignette of whiskey making as it would have gone through to the late 50s or 60s. And that's one of the reasons why I think it's a remarkable publication. And I also did it, just kind of widening it, again, very briefly. You know, it's something I, I, I've kind of mused about for, for a number of years, that, that Scotch whiskey, to some extent, is just lucky. You know, you know, you know Irish independence closes, closes off a market. You know, uh, taxation, et cetera, et cetera, and Ireland closes down distilleries. You have prohibition in America, which effectively shutting distilling down there from 1919 till after the Second World War, really. Uh, <clears throat> Canada simply supplying supplying America when it started up, and even you know bloodied Scotch somehow emerges as the last man standing. Uh, so, so there's an element of you know as well as great entrepreneurship and marketing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the blending houses, an element of just sheer bloody good fortune. Yeah. Yeah, I, I note that Mr. Cheezer has made a comment about something that I uh, was was struck by, which is the um, amount of peat that's being used in the Speyside distilleries. Mm. And, and that's one, one of the ways um, that we can sort of get near, I think, to what this stuff might have tasted like. Because we, we know that in the 1890s, distillers, particularly in the Highlands, Speyside, were um, were doing whatever they could to actually reduce the potency of their whiskey, reduce the flavour. They're putting in purifiers, starting to look at condensers and stuff like that. Um, but and yet in these accounts, everyone's using peat, and many distilleries. Um, there's something I've got in my notes about Ben Rinnis, um, which talks about the amount of peat that's being used there, and it makes it sound as though it's almost sort of on the cusp of being an Isla whiskey. Yeah. So, so these whiskies didn't take any prisoners. And I suspect, again, as Mr. Cheezer hypothesizes, that it was in the 50s and 60s that this, this reduction um, took place. And, and that's probably largely because of the, of the, the palate and taste of American consumers, I would, I would suggest. And I, I find it very interesting that Cardew what, what was mentioned as the most heavily peated of, of uh, the space side whiskies at the time. Yeah. Uh, just kind of moving on here, <clears throat> uh, the missing details. <laughs> you know, the, the, the looking, at, looking at the book in, in, in general, you know, I immediately turned to Mortlach, uh, I have to admit. Uh, I went, okay, we'll find out all about, you know, who brought in the 2.81 distillation. Not mentioned. Uh, Talisker claimed to be the only triple distilled single malt in, in Scotland. You know, Frustrating, uh, was it really? Uh, you know, the description is amazing, but you know, was it really? You know, so so that there's there is an awful lot of things missing there, uh, which I find you know the same with Barnard. You know, it's almost there, and then you're you're wanting some more, yeah. and then it's just kind of withdrawn because uh, it just seems to be, you know, whoever wrote this, and maybe this is the question, you know, whoever wrote this book. Uh, either they were told not to ask this question or they weren't interested in that question or they just went around with a tick list going, how big is your ash ton? And, you know, do you have a, a Greens economizer? Uh, and if not, why not? 
you know. Uh, Neil, what, 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 what do you think about the authorship and the, and the writing of the book itself? Um, so Nick and I bounced this around last week um, and we, we came to a working hypothesis uh, which I've, I've also kind of checked with one or two others and uh, we, we think it's probably probably a single author but not in the way you might think. So um, it's not a Barnard, it's Barnard Mark II in the sense that it's very clearly uh, riffing on Barnard. So um, Nick pointed out in the um, in the language used about tortuous, um, the word tortuous is used a few times. So I did a quick search and I found tortuous is used in both the Del Ewan entries. Uh, tortuous winding uh, rivers and tortuous... Um, uh, the tortuous spay, I think he calls it. So, End of the spay. yes, that's it. So, so there's clearly an overlap there. But our working hypothesis is we think it's probably, um, in the sense that they're advertorials, they've probably put surveys or similar out to these distilleries because some of them are not there, some are missing. You know, for uh, tomatins missing, for example. So, we think it might be that, um, the, the distilleries have responded with, for example, the technical details, and then the, the writer has embellished the cases, embellished the profiles of the distilleries with your... So some of them have got certain mythologies, and um, there's more than one or two mentions of attempting to murder the gauger, which I thought was, <laughs> was quite, uh, quite untoward, but it was, presumably it was uh, apocryphal. But um, So... So we think uh, the working the working hypothesis is we think it's probably um, a combination of the, the distilleries and their agents um, writing profiles of them, brought to the, the the wine and spirit trade record, and then embellished and kind of written up for the for the readership. Um, and that might be completely wrong. And that's the beauty of historical research. You have these working hypotheses. You you think you've got you know, you think you've got it on the money. Yes, this is definitely the case. And then out of nowhere, someone appears with a document or a series of documents that shows you were completely wrong. And that's okay because that's that's the beauty and joy of historical research. So yeah. that's why I'm very clear. It's a working hypothesis. If someone can prove us wrong, all the better. I'd be delighted to hear. I mean, like um, un unlike Barnard these accounts do not make a travelogue. You know, there's only one really definite visit here, uh, which uh, Leon uh, discussed with Arthur last week, which is Glenugie, which sounds like a sort of modern day press trip where they all get pissed and end up having a Highland Games by the, by moonlight, you know, sort of thing that so-called influencers seem to love to do. Um, but apart from that, although the writer mentions visiting distilleries and having visited or mentions representatives visiting distilleries, there's nothing really to suggest that he, or, or if I may offer a heretical thought in the world of whiskey, that she, that she um, uh, wrote that wasn't from, from accounts, from a historical gazetteer on one side and from a copy of Barnard on the other side. It's a desk job. It's someone bored out of their wits um, in Great Tower Street, which is in, in the middle of where the whiskey industry and the wine and spirits industry used to be, but it's actually moving out to the West End. They're all going to St. James and stuff like that. And I rather suspect the wine and spirit trade record is a bit left behind. Um, so it's someone there. Uh, and and it, why couldn't it be a woman? Dorothy L. Sayers is up the road hmm. writing advertising copy for beer and whiskey and all sorts of things. So I don't think we should assume it's a man that, 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 that was writing it, but it's someone at a desk with a typewriter churning this stuff out. And I can tell you, having read through to page 588, that by the time you get to about page 500, you can tell the author is bored stiff. Yeah, yeah. Really, absolutely. It's like, how many more of these things have I got to write? So it could be that <laughs> Beaumont and Tomartin and Booths and... Uh, Burroughs and all the rest of it didn't get in because they just went on strike. They said, I'm not, I'm not writing any more of these. You know, it's just got... <laughs> the, 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 uh, I forget which distillery is uh, off the top of my head, but it is kind of... Uh, <laughs> there's kind of painstaking descriptions about how whiskey is made, you know, and a couple of occasions, you know, you know, cuts, cut points and you know, yeah. drops and all of that. And then towards the end of it is, I don't need to tell you about how whiskey <laughs> is. <laughs> you know, you know the, 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 <laughs> 
<laughs> there's, an, <clears throat> there's another point here, Dave, which is quite interesting, uh, actually, because it cuts across a few ways. On the one hand, you know, I've heard people go, well, we've never seen any of this. It's astonishing, you know. And then, of course, people said, well, we've seen the Highland Park, uh, we've seen the Highland Park entry because that was published separately and Ian Buxton, I think, did a reprint of it. But many of these photographs have been in circulation um, in, dif in different places. And I've looked at the photographs as closely as I was able to. And they seem to have used very often uh, local photographers. So there's a photograph of Ard Begg, which was uh, used as a postcard widely in the 1920s and credited to Cameron, who was the phot photographer on Isla, who did many of the distilleries there. Um, David Sturk, in his Campbelltown book, has got a picture that's used in this article about Springbank, of the Springbank still, it's absolutely the same photograph. And David mentions a collection that he used from local Campbelltown photographers. So I'm rather assuming that it came from that and that they may, may have taken the pictures uh, or supplied the pictures um, for, uh, for the record as well. And supplied is important because I'm not entirely sure if all of these pictures are necessarily taken at the same time as the articles are written and published. So I think there's a bit of hesitation there. And certainly the photograph of Talisker that's used uh, dates from the 1890s, because by the time the article was published, um, there were two malt kilns at Talisker, and the photographs that's there only shows, shows one malt kiln. Mm. So the, the, the images, um, and, and I remember also Alan, um, Alan Winchester telling me that he'd seen all of the photographs from the, uh, from the Glenn Libert article. He said, oh, we had all of these in the archives. And I was given uh, in about 1991 or 92 at Lagavulin by Mike Nicholson a box of glass slides. And mm -hmm. uh, Mike said, well, I've found these in the cupboard. Don't know, don't know what they are, but you, know, you have them for the archive. And we got them printed up and we wanted to believe that they were Lagavulin or maybe Malt Mill, or none of them seemed to fit together. It was a very odd selection. They're all in this book, but none, none of them are Lagavulin or Malt Mill. So, I th so the photographs are sort of in wide circulation and also a, a bit of a warning because we love the photographs so much, but they're not necessarily of exactly when we think they, they, they might be. And of course, yeah. some aren't photographed and there are some that are just, I mean, I think it's it Tobermory that's a sort of drawing thing that they've got there. I mean, uh, the, the, the kind of maybe one last question here. But, uh, just to kind of <laughs> before that, just talking about the, the fact it isn't a travelogue. You, you don't get the, the kind of wonderful uh, narrative that you get from Barnard, you know, where he suddenly becomes all romantic and talks about carriage journeys and fairy yeah. glen and all of that. There is only one uh, that, that I kind of picked out, which was uh, Old Pulteney, and the introduction of <laughs> to which says, Wick possesses few attributes, uh, attractions, sorry, Wick possesses few attractions, either natural or artificial. You know, I don't think much has changed really since the 1920s. But, but uh, in in some ways, you know, looking at it from from a from a writer's point of view, and both you gentlemen are, are, are writers as well. Is this the start of writing about whiskey being formalised in some ways? There seems to be this continuing at romantic attachment to smuggling, for example. You know, you can't think of anything else to write about. Let's throw in a smuggler or two. Uh, I don't really know what to write about Highland Park. Let's talk about the Vikings. You know, so, so there does seem to be something either extraordinarily contemporary about this or the fact that whiskey writing today hasn't moved on that much from well, I think it's drawn it's drawn from a very limited palette Dave I think is what you have to say <laughs> what, 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 what did you think of of, of that Neil I mean did, did you see I, I think so one of the things that struck me when I was reading was the repetition of these mythologies you know and these kind of hoary stories of illicit distilling and so on and then I mean I, I don't think whiskey writing has really moved on significantly from that um, present company acceptance you know, I think and I, I say that you know quite genuinely because I think when I, when I look at you know your your um your association of whiskey with culture I think is really important and that's one of the things which is really apparent um 
and some of the images and some of the photographies, the kind of the the nature of the industry and the the community association it has and so on. And it is a community. There's no question there. One of the things we've not mentioned actually is the philanthropy that's mentioned several times throughout the book about supporting local communities and village halls and everything else. And so when it comes to writing, I mean, whiskey writing is dominated by marketing uh, 101. You know, it's, 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 you know, they're always trying to sell. So these are advertorials. And so they're written in a certain way. They're written to kind of sell, sell the produce, sell the story, sell the industry and sell the mythology. So, um, so I, I, I mean, I took the right with a pinch of salt because, as Nick said, by the end it was clear they were pretty sick of, of repeating you know, the kind of same tropes that, that get reeled out uh, ad nauseum. In fact, I'd said to Nick last week that one of the things I think um, that one of the things I like about the Liquid Antiquarian is that you're you're unveiling new stories. Now these are old stories, but they're not known, or they're or they're interesting insights and so on. You haven't gone into this trap of repeating. You know, George Smith's two guns and, and all these other stories that everyone has heard a billion times over. And there's elements of that in this book where they, they do repeat those mythologies. They're clearly, whoever the writer is, is clearly um, immersed in some degree of the, the folklore of the history of, of the industry and so on. And that's fine. You know, that's okay because these are advertorials. So we're, I think we've probably settled on that. They're, they're definitely written in that style. So I don't mind, you know, if you recognise it for what it is, then you, you accept that there are certain trade-offs and you you will get exposed to certain tropes and so on, and, and that's the nature of the game. Um, but certainly, I mean, if you were to do a, a kind of version of this now, I don't think I don't think there'd be many people that would be repeating the same mythologies that we've heard for the last 200 years. Well, I, I would hope not. Uh, uh, it's interesting, Dave, I'm just going to make a point, because I see there's mm -hmm. someone called John Allen, um, oh, John uh, Allen has made a remark there saying that what, what we've got here is copywriting uh, and there's good and there's bad. And uh, John's absolutely right. And, and John is, if anyone knows John, he's a brilliant copywriter. So he should know copywriting when he sees it. But uh, I object to it because just, for example, when I joined United Distillers in 1990 and given this sort of archive job, it's like, well, what have we got that's history? And actually most of the stuff we had that was history had evolved from pieces of copywriting. It wasn't history, it was copywriting, but everyone believed it was absolutely true. You know, the, let's the, look at the the no, this isn't history. So, so the industry's done a brilliant job of reifying these as history, though. So they yeah, said yeah, yeah. That the industry sells its history by reifying these mythologies into truths. Yeah. And it's you know, you can talk to anyone and it's the same with single malt. So anyone will tell you now, oh, single malt's much better than a blend because it's been a reification of this yeah. mythology around what these actually are. And so, you know, that, you're right. It's, it's copywriting good and bad. It's not history per se. You know, I, 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 would, try and, I would try and verify anything I'm writing as a, mm. as a general rule of thumb. If I'm putting something, if I'm committing my name to something in text and it's historical, you can bet I've checked three or four different sources to, to triangulate and verify that there's an element of truth there. It's but not always possible, but... The thing is, Neil, though, that these things become... They become history because they're there and it's what everyone's been told in companies and it's what brand managers are told when they join and it's in the training courses that companies offer. So suddenly you've got something that was... And there, there, I could, could give you some instances of these pe co copywriting stuff that's been done in the 60s when someone's basically made stuff up. And then over the years, it's become a truth. Mm -hmm. and, and if it's a truth, then it can't be challenged. Yeah. You know, and I think that's a problem for the industry. And, and, and as Dave sort of referred to, I think, tangentially or not, um, there are some truths that, that are widely believed in the industry that are very strongly challenged um, by, by some of the entries here. So there'll be some where brand people will look at, at the text and photographs and will be delighted. I mean, I was astonished. There's a photograph in here of the Highland Park still house. And I have a photograph that I took when I was on Orkney on a sailing trip about six years ago. And it's almost identical, taken from the same angle. It's like it could be the same, exactly the same place. And there are other still houses and then other distilleries where things don't quite look as the way you might have expected from what's written. So that's 
going to be interesting to see how some brand owners reconcile themselves to that or or no doubt probably just ignore it you know well yeah i, I hope not and I, I do i do hope you know also uh, as an agent whiskey not a writer about whiskey uh, that, <clears throat> that the whole genre of whiskey writing does change because it, it's become kind of calcified anyway it's, it's a it's a, it's a different topic uh, to conclude gentlemen because you know we've kind of ranted about that oh, it's just a bunch of advertorials and you know it might be written by dorothy l sayers you know which is a wonderful theory uh but how important is this not knocking away we're, we're just trying to say I actually don't believe this is an absolute, absolute gospel. There's a bigger story behind it. You know, how important is it and what has it done to add to your understanding of the industry? Neil? Um, I really like it. I've got a lot of affection for this. And, I, you know, I, you can have affection for something and not think it's perfect. And I think that's important to recognise here, that we're not dealing with perfection and actually, you shouldn't be looking for perfection. You shouldn't be looking for an exact record of the way things exactly were, you know, 100 years ago, because that doesn't exist. That's not the nature of historical writing, of historical inquiry, and of our understanding of what history is. What this is, is a really nice record of the industry 100 years ago that has its, has its weaknesses, it has its limitations, but ultimately, it's a fabulous document right it's a fabulous you know con consolidated piece that that leon has done wonders to uncover it's been there hiding in plain sight which is the beauty of, of this as well because as a historian i can't tell you how often you know what you're looking for is hiding in plain sight it's you have to reconcile yourself to that early on if you want to be a historian if you want to do this properly you have to recognize that you will miss things you will miss the most obvious thing in the world and it'll, you know, and it'll frustrate you, but you're just happy it's out there. And I feel the same way about this book. I'm happy it's out there. I'm happy that people are getting the, the opportunity to read it and to enjoy it and to, to kind of wax lyrical about what it might mean, what it might represent, the reading against the grain and so on. Because what it does is it energizes um, people's kind of perception and value of history in relation to the industry especially. And I really like that. You know, I like the fact that we're debating it, that you've got four different liquid antiquarian uh, episodes discussing this from four different perspectives, um, that there's there's discussions on Facebook, there's discussions between friends, there's text messages going back and forth, phone calls, Nick's going back to the British Library to have me look around there as well. All that has come about because this book is out, and that's a really good thing. So that's my, you know, that's my kind of view of it. I really like it. Right. Nick, in, in conclusion... Well, well, in conclusion, this this is just an astonishing book. I mean, it it, it really is. My, my only criticism is that Barnard, when I'm sitting here writing, comes off the shelf probably two days a week. Two day, yeah, at least two days a week. This is a lot harder to get off the shelf. So physically, it's a bit of a bastard to deal with. But apart from that, there's so much richness in it, and you know, to see some like. You know, we've gone on about Campbelltown and maybe not seem to be too kind to it. But to see these pictures, even if they are in the collection that David Sturck used, no, no, he only had one, I think, in his book from there. So to, to, for them to be brought to life here is is astonishing. And I think some of the detail, I mean, I mean I'm, we haven't talked about the more technical process stuff. And I'm going to be very interested to hear uh, next week's discussion when we've got people that really know about making whiskey talking about what they've read and seen in it, because I think there is an awful lot in this book about that. If you really work hard at it to pull out um, the stuff. So it's just so much, as Neil said, it's got everyone talking, it's got everyone excited. And I do think it's an astonishing achievement for, I mean, I'm going to call him the editor, Leon Kubler, who, when he first told me about this four or five years ago, is just astonished to, to hear it. And I think it's a brilliant job done by James Eady, um, as is as is the 15-year-old uh, Kalida, which is very nice too. So that's all I've got to say, Dave. Astonishing. Astonishing. Uh, well, may, may I say, gentlemen, you too have been astonishing tonight. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I've learned a huge amount. You know, it's always great chatting with you because uh, that's why you're historians and Arthur and I are just mere antiquarians. Because... <laughs> 
<laughs> Arthur, uh, thank you. Merci. Thank you for being behind the scenes there and pulling up these slides. <laughs> incredible applause. Uh, Can it be like this every week? I like this. I just sit and have a Kalida and watch. It's been absolutely amazing. And I think it's a huge achievement, as you said, from Leon. But one of the lovely things is I know how much he will have enjoyed this because it's been a slog for him for five years ago, I think, the first time he mentioned it to me. And it, and it founded a couple of times. But what's kept him going is whenever he showed people a little bit and whenever it got closer to being released, he kept saying, I'm just loving seeing how people respond to it. And everyone responds to it differently. And I think tonight, you guys, you two, have made a huge contribution to everyone. I think everyone's going to be picking up the book again tomorrow and having another look at it and looking at it with fresh eyes. So, um, yeah, a superb evening. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dave. Everyone here commented uh, as well. Uh, there's a whole lot of our... our Friends and family there. Uh, Ian Russell, nice to see you. And it's great to see the Jags doing so well the, the, this year. Mr. Cheeser re re reappearing. Uh, Joe McCarker, as ever. Francis uh, Cuthbert there. Thank you very much for, for tuning in. All of you, uh, th thanks for all the comments. Sorry we can get around to, to answering them all. But great to see so many people being so engaged with the discussion and also with the book itself. So, so uh, thanks. Arthur, we've got another one coming up. We do. Let's wave goodbye to Nick and Neil. Thank you again, guys. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We do. Uh, so Nick said next week, it's actually Thursday, isn't it? We've got the distillers coming. Um, and we had promised another one on Friday, but frankly, we're running out of steam, aren't we, Dave? The, pre <laughs> <laughs> the preparation of these slides and the preparation of getting this little show together, it does uh, get in the the day job, rather. So we can Friday, but um, just so we can focus on Thursday, because it's all becoming a little bit too much. It does mention a Friday episode on the, on the end credits, but no, it's Thursday. We're going to have Alan Winchester and Robert Fleming. So Alan, well formerly of Glenn Livett, but um, so much to his career, and Robert Fleming, who's been working in the industry for decades and decades, and Angus Dundee. So it'll be really interesting. So uh, lots of talks of pipes and fermentation and uh, and all the things that, um, well, it's a little above my head in a different way to tonight has been above my head. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll maybe find out how, uh, how the, the, the green... <laughs> The Greens Economizer works, you know, so so there we go. But, yeah, please, 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 guys, uh, do tune into that one. It's going to be absolutely fascinating. As, as Nick said, it's the other side of it and really finding out how, how whiskey was made uh, by a couple of incredibly experienced distillers and lovely people. Thanks so much, Dave. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks.